body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And with the cup, in the same way after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, and whenever you drink it, do it in remembrance of me. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you that we can break bread together. I thank you that we can call one another friend and family. And more importantly, God, I thank you that we can call you friend and family, Father. So bless this day today, Lord. Bless this communion. Pray that you would be honored through it, through our hearts, through our thoughts, through our words, and through our actions. In Jesus' name. Continuing on, we have been in our sermon series titled Unconditional, and today is our last segment of that. So before I say anything else, let me get out of the way and pray. Father, God, I thank you for today again. God, I thank you for your word. I pray that you would show up and show out. God, that you would show off your glory. Uh, that this again would be holy and solely about you. So Lord, as I always ask, and I'll continue to ask for all of my days, I pray that I would decrease so that you could increase. So God, meet me in my weakness and show yourself strong. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, I've got a little buzzing up here. I, mean, I don't know what that's from, but... Um, so, moving into this series, or this last installment of our series, uh, we are going to be digging into John 9 verses 1 through 41. I know that's a nice chunk. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to read it out loud with me. I got this. Um, but before we go into here, uh, I'd like to just ask you a question. Um, do any of you know anybody who is a show-off? Let me just ask that. I sometimes can look in the mirror and be like, you are a show-off. And I don't intend to, um, but I think sometimes it's, it's natural uh, it's just a natural piece of our DNA. And if you're ever around somebody who's a show-off, you know what, when I was in college, I, I wasn't planning on saying this, but whatever. Um, when I was in college, I had a couple of my buddies would always call me one-up because anytime somebody would tell a story, I'd be like, well, I got a story for you. And I would one-up it or they would do something and it would be as if I was trying to show off and show them that I was greater as if there was something that I could do that would be amazing. Uh, but my favorite show-offs, uh, these are my Facebook, the Facebook show-offs when tax time comes. And then they get their money and then they spread that money out in a fan and be like, look at all this money. And the only time of the year they're showing off that bread is when their taxes come. I don't know about you if, you, if you have Facebook, but when I see that, it drives me crazy. Drives me crazy. And you're also asking for somebody to rob you. Um, but they flaunt that money, those Facebook ballers. And so uh, if that's you, stop. Um, but if that's, not, if that's not you, that's great. Um, but in, this, in, this, in these verses here, you're going to see that, that God just shows off just a little bit. Um, so let me just read this and uh, bear with our projector a little bit. Our projector's tripping today. Um, and so if half of a word is cut off, just forgive me and just try to stick with me. So uh, Jesus heals the man who was born blind. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him. Wash in the pool of Siloam. This word meant sent. So the man went and washed, and he came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him beg and ask, Isn't this the same guy who used to sit and beg? And some claimed that he was, and others said, No, he only looks like that man. But he himself insisted, I, I am that man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, The man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. Take note, he didn't say he spit in there and made the mind. So that would have been interesting. 
uh, story to tell. But he said they, he made some mud and he put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Salome and wash. So I went and washed and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. So they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore, the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. Amen. Some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath religion. But others asked, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So the people were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, he is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received a sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked. Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it now that he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now or who has opened his eyes, we do not know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, he is of age, ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know is I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you did not listen. What do you want to hear it again? Sorry, why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, you are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And then they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked, tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment, I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. God had his blessing on his word today. And so you see here, we go back to that whole show off thing. Uh, I, I came up with a couple of reasons why I feel that, that people show off. And, and I could be wrong, but I feel like some of it is, is some self that comes out when I read it. So I believe that showy people believe that they didn't get the attention that they should have gotten, that they deserved. And so then they show off as a way to clear one message like, hey, I'm here. See me. Another one is, is that very end piece, that, that I'm here. Notice me. So that person is essentially begging you to see them, to notice them. Okay? They, they are very, they're very concerned with the opinions of man. So it's really the opposite opinion of, of a believer who, as a believer, I only care what God has to say. Because right. if God is pleased, I don't care who else is displeased. Yeah. My wife's grandfather said that yesterday. And I was like, wow, you are always on time, God. He said, if God is pleased, then who cares who is displeased? And so, naturally, I've got to a point in my life where the opinions of man don't mean too much because there's only one person that I'm trying to please, and I want him to receive all the glory and all the honor. So showy people do their best to show off their best traits to prove why they are worthy of your attention. But see, Jesus, Jesus is a different story. See, sometimes God uses our obedience, and when he says, go and we go, and then something miraculous happens because as the last song that we played said, he is a God of miracles. And so, and then on the flip side, sometimes God uses our sufferings, our shortcomings, our circumstances, and he uses the good, the bad, and the ugly of all those things, and he uses it for his own glory. And here in this situation, in, in John uh, chapter 9, verse 3, he said, neither this man nor his parents sinned. 
said Jesus. But this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. Let me preface that a little bit. It was common belief to the Jewish people of that day that when calamity or suffering was happening, it was because somebody had sinned. It was, it was always a consequence of sin. So if you were born blind or you were born deaf or you could not speak, it was because your parents did something. Okay? And so we live in a world where now that, that good behavior sometimes isn't always rewarded. And then on the flip, we live in a world where bad behavior sometimes doesn't really get punished or suffer any consequences of it. Um, and because of that concept right there, that whole uh, the, the good and the bad of it, we see that innocent people get hurt all the time and today I'm not going to talk about uh, why do bad things happen to good people that's a different sermon for a different day but if God took suffering away whenever we asked we would we wouldn't follow Jesus be, because uh, we loved him or we had reverence for him we would we would follow Jesus out of comfort and convenience right. and that's not why we serve God so the regardless of the reason of our suffering it sh leads me to our first point right away don't expect God to just show up. Expect him to show off. Amen. And so we've seen in the last four weeks going forward, the, the first week we talked about Zacchaeus. Man, God was showing off because he knew Zacchaeus' heart and he called him out of the tree, healed and changed him before his feet hit the ground. And then in the second week, um, or, or, or was it second or third? Now I'm mixing it up. But we, we talked about um, Jesus healing the leper, week two. And, and he could have done it from a distance, like me to Andres, so it was all the way in the back, and he was going to be like, abracadabra, you're healed. But he went up and touched the man because he didn't care about the opinions of people because he wanted the Father to be pleased. Okay? And then in the midst of that, he wanted to show that he cares about people. Okay? And then week three, we talked about the woman at the well. And, and, and all, of you, all of these things, we see miracles happening. This, this man's heart was changed. Jesus heals the leper. Okay, woman at the well, the, all the people in the surrounding area come to have an encounter with Jesus Christ and give their lives to him. That's a miracle, right? So don't expect God to just show, show up. Expect him to show off. So when you come in this place, I've said it before, but come with great expectation. Come with expectation that miracles are going to be happening. Come with expectation that breakthroughs are going to happen. i got to highlight this, and it's not just because she's my wife, but this woman, Andre said, Jessica's his better half. This woman is my better half. Because I tell you what, I was a little emotional this morning, and I was getting nervous for I preach because I don't want to show up. I want God to show up. And sometimes you can be overwhelmed, and your week isn't always great, and sometimes you have things that happen, and it gets you in that place, and we get caught up thinking about how the waves are crashing into us that we forget about the, the miracles on both sides. Of, of, of that suffering time and this morning I was feeling it and I, I was in there and she's like how are you and I was like I'm a little emotional a little overwhelmed and so she prayed with me right and I'm like mm -hmm. I, I said to her I said listen I feel bad that you just wasted that amazing prayer on me and you could have shared it with everybody else and I was like and I don't mean that in a bad way but this woman loves God right yes. and so we go in the back and we're praying and I still get emotional because I love God and I want him to be pleased and I want him to be glorified and, and we're about to pray but she prayed like I just you can preach yeah she like I if there was any doubt left in this room that God wasn't going to show up it was removed when we said amen because right. she killed the game like it was premeditated yes. like she prayed and that's why I love this woman because she makes me a better man and Jesus does the same thing to us. He makes us better men and he makes us better women. Women, And when, 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 so with that great expectation of expecting him to not just show up, but to show off his glory, to show off his mercy, to show off his grace, to show off his goodness, to show off his kindness, to show off his love, to show off that joy that we can only have in him, to show off that peace that only comes from him. See, we think about these things and these things only come from God. But when God made you, he was really showing off. Right. And I've got to highlight the fact that, that there was uh, one one little cell from mommy and there was one little cell from daddy and and those those two little cells started to make you and and the cell from daddy had a lot of work to do he had a long ways to go to get there and out of all the people that all of the the cells that were trying to make their way there only one made it so you could give him some praise because he did some work but you know god strengthened him and i'm not going to get into that lesson today uh, i teach health at school and i wouldn't deliver it just that way i'd be really blunt about it um, but so these cells, they, they, they meet, and, and the meeting place, and, and, and the one from mommy carried 23 chromosomes, just 23. And, and the one from daddy carried 23 chromosomes. And when, when they blended together, they made a DNA code, a brand new DNA code that was 3 billion characters long. Wow. 
And it's a description of who you are and who God ordained you to be, who God called you to be. In spite of everything that was going to happen, he made you in the way that he made you for a reason. It wasn't by mistake and it wasn't by happenstance that he called you in that way. And if you wanted to read that code out one, one character at a time, one second at a time, it would take you 96 years. Wow. Um, so you know that God is big and he really thought out the fact uh, on how he was going to make you and that you were this extravagant thing. So 96 years it would take. So, um, so you know, now three days later, now we're up to 16 cells. So we got a little bit of multiplication. And now you've got about 75 trillion in your body. So uh, I think that every day that you look in the mirror, you need to be like, wow, God is really showing off. And we need to think more highly of ourselves because some of us, we beat ourselves down because we get caught up with comparison with what we see in magazines and what we see in covers and what we see in social media and what we see on television. And a lot of that is frauds and fake. And one thing I can't take is a fraud and a fake when it comes to faith. And so you need to look in the mirror and be like, I am wonderfully and beautifully made. That he formed me in my mother's womb. And when he did so, he was showing off. So when you, what, what I want you to say, I want you to look to your neighbor, to your left. That's that way. And I want you to say, God was showing off when he made you. Now, it, you look to the left and we said it. And now I need you to look to the right. To the right. And then I need you to say the same thing. God was showing off when he made you too. Go ahead and say it. So if you think about how much DNA. How much DNA is in your body. There is enough DNA in your body. My wife is up here geeking with Ashley. You guys all right? Yeah. Um, there's enough DNA in your body. To stretch from right here to the moon, 178,000 times. <laughs> so let me just be clear on how much DNA we got. So from right here where we're at, all the way to the moon, and then back, 178,000 times. I think God thought out you. And he formed you to be you. And he knows you like he knows the palm of his hands. And and what's crazy about our bodies is... is let me, so 1,000, 2,000, 1,000, 1,000. In that three seconds, 50,000 cells in your body died. Wow. And now since I've said that, 50,000 more of them have appeared. Every three seconds, all day and all night, that is happening in your body. And some of you wonder why you're so tired all the time. Because your body's working really hard to do that. And so God is really showing off. But that's not even the coolest part. See, I think the coolest part about our bodies is our eyes. Our eyes are the most technologically advanced thing in the history of, of the world. Like every computer thing, it, the eye shames it. There, okay, so there's a million optic nerve endings when your eyes go to be formed, right? And so they leave the optic nerve center of your brain. And then there's another one that, that the, the, a million leave the eyes. And so they all have to find their exact same match. So a million of them have to find the exact same match. And if one of them doesn't match up and doesn't find his match, we don't have vision in that eye. And so there, in the womb, this is when this is happening. This isn't happening like when you're grown. This is, so we have no sight. So we, it's the most technologically advanced thing. And so we, as scripture stated, the work of God is displayed in each one of our lives in verse 3. And so you're a walking miracle. You're a reflection of God's glory and his goodness, and his love, and his kindness, and you really are a blessing to this world, whether you like to believe it or not. Now, that doesn't mean get all cocky about it, and be like, yeah, I'm a blessing to this world. But what that does mean is, God has blessed me with giftings, he's blessed me with talents, and he wants me to use those giftings, and those talents, to tell the world, and in the midst of telling the world, God is going to show up, and he's not just going to show up and be satisfied, he's going to show off. And so that's our first point. So don't expect God to just show up. You better expect him to show off. Better than you could show off. Better than the Facebook ballers can show off. Okay. God is going to show off. And, and I want to highlight this one thing. In verse 7, he says, go. He said, go. And, and the quotations are around it. I feel like God didn't just be like, go. I feel like he was like, hey, go. Go. Go to that water and go wash yourself. And that's it. And, and what's crazy is he washes himself in the water. And all of a sudden, what happens? He can see. And so this isn't a point. Um, but it's a point that I want to tell to you that if you get a go from heaven, even hell can't say no. Amen. If you get a go for, yeah, you missed your hand clap moment right there. It's okay. 
Um, if you get a go from Jesus, if you get a yes from heaven, even hell can't say no. And so that was extra. You didn't have to pay for that. And that wasn't even a part of everything. But I just wanted to highlight that fact that when God says go, there is reason behind it. That it wasn't just, oh, I'm hopeful that you do this. He's like, no, go do it. And when you do, you're going to face some opposition. But I've overcome the world. So what you can face can't stop me from getting the point that I want to cross for this thing that I've ordained in time to happen. And so it's important to know that when you, when you do get a go from Jesus and you're going to get a go from Jesus, number one, be obedient and go. And number two, understand that if he said to go, where he guides, he provides. That's right. Amen. Okay. So when, uh, Pastor Mark said on Friday that uh, when we had our, our, our friend raiser, fundraiser, he said, when you get the vision, God is going to give you provision. Yes. And so that's important to highlight there. And so when you look at verse 24, um, can we get verse 24 up there? I'm, you know what? I'm just actually reading from here because I'm going to cut words off and get confused because I have ADHD. So a second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Now, in the, in the regular NIV, um, it says, give glory to God and tell the truth. Okay, but, it, but in this, it says, give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. Okay, so sometimes we get so caught up in judging others. Mm -hmm. We get so caught up in casting judgment and giving our opinions on things. Uh, that we're actually focused on the wrong things. So what they should have been focused on was the fact that Jesus just spit in some mud and made some mud and wiped it on his eyes. And all he had to do was go to the pool, the healing waters, and wash himself and he could see. Wow. We should have been rejoicing in the fact that old boy was blind his whole life and now he can see. But the Pharisees were too worried about a couple things. They didn't want to believe because they were jealous of Jesus. They were jealous of his ministry. And because what he was doing, he was getting a big following. And they weren't getting that following anymore. Because as Jesus' fame increased, their fame and following decreased. And so haters are going to hate. Okay? Right. Don't worry about them. But they also right. wanted, to, they wanted to accuse him of working on the Sabbath because that was, that was taboo. You didn't do that. And so when he was kneading the clay or kneading the mud, okay, that was work. Okay, and then when he went and healed him, that was work. And so the Pharisees were always on the get out. And what they were doing is they were trying to get out and get Jesus. And so his following would fall because they wanted to call him a sinner. But Jesus lived a sinless life. So, that, so what you have is you have those religious folks. And, and they're trying to destroy Jesus' ministry. But now you can actually think about the apathetic folks too. The, the, the people who don't want to believe or, or, or say that they don't care or they don't believe in anything. And, and, or they know that they're living in sin and they're making some wrong choices. And they feel like, oh, well, I don't want to go do that. I don't want to come to God. I don't want to come to Christ because he's going to ask me to get my sins together and clean my life up first. And really it's actually the opposite. He just says, come and I'll change you from the inside out. But they were feeling convicted and they felt that, you know what, if I had to come to Jesus, I'm going to have a lifestyle change and that's going to be really hard for me to give up these things but but again we're, we're a guy as he provides and so if he's asking you to give something up you have to give something up right so don't be tight-fisted with it whether that's tithes and offerings whether that's talents okay whether that's a bad relationship uh whether that's some choices that you make that affects people negatively okay all of those things are are equally important you don't need to get your life together you just need to come to jesus that's right this week i read a quote um a buddy of mine shared this on Facebook, and there's a Christian hip hop artist named Ashawn Burgundy, and he, he shared a quote, and, I, and I'm going to read it because I'm not going to paraphrase it, but it's really relevant for this season that we're in, is in November and December. So he says, If Jesus were fake and a figment of our imagination, no one would hate him. Santa and the Tooth Fairy have made statements in books over the years, and their sayings garner no scrutiny and never offend anyone. But Jesus' words, they hurt. And they heal because they're real. And sometimes we want to give Jesus the stiff arm because what he's saying might hurt us. And the reason it hurts us is because we are holding on to things that he's been asking us to give up for far too long. Amen. <laughs> and then there's also, we don't believe that the God of the universe came to seek and save that which was lost and that he became to heal. But in this story, we talk about healing, this, man, this blind man being healed. And I, and I can't help that we look at that picture on the wall there, and that's of Kids Fest this summer, and we service over 170 families and kids giving their life to Christ. But I, I just think of that, that most special moment that God had me like this, and I'm crying, and I didn't know what to do. And I remember I went up to Jessica, and she's like, are you okay? And the moment was this, is there was this boy named Nestor. Mm. And 
he had two other brothers and the middle boy can hear perfectly. The older boy, which is Nestor, was born and he could hear, but he went deaf. And then the younger boy was born deaf. And so Pastor Mark and, and I and, and Papa Bill, as I say, or Pastor Bill, however you'd like to, we go and, and we pray over this boy. We pray over him once and, and we check with his brother and his brother signs and I can't sign other than this. Um, um, and I'm hungry, tap, give me some food. <laughs> um, um, but anyway, so we, we, you know, we, we pray over this boy and we check, nothing. We're, we're, we're believing. We know that there's power in the Holy Spirit. And he said, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will have power and you'll go to the ends of the earth, or world with it, right? And so we, we have this verse and, and we're believing that there's power in the Holy Spirit. We're believing that God can heal. So we come up later that day on a Thursday and we pray for this boy again and we get nothing. And then so later in the day, we come back a third time and we come back and we like want to pray with you again and we lay hands on him and we pray for him again and nothing and then Friday shows up and Scott Sprout comes up to the Gaga Ball pit and all the cool things seem to happen at the Gaga Ball pit so if you've never played Gaga Ball you better get your life and go play it because <laughs> uh, it is fun and so anyways he comes up with a megaphone now keep in mind this boy can't hear and all of a sudden he comes up with the megaphone and he's not even like directly in front of him he's just to the side of the pit and scott sprout said okay kids and all of a sudden you see this boy who's been deaf since he was like two go like this oh and so mark and i were like did you yeah you, you can give god some joy for that one absolutely Glory. and so all of a sudden we're like wait wait and so we called his little brother over and we're like can I, we need you to ask your brother if, if he can hear us <laughs> we, we could have asked him ourselves but decided to make sure and so um he says, you know, we're like, ask him if he can hear us. And, and he goes, Aww. and we're like, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up. And so Pastor Mark went up behind him and, and he said, he told his brother, he says, I want you to tell him to repeat what I say. Keep in mind, this boy's been deaf since he was two, so he hasn't talked. Okay. So he's been deaf. And so in the midst of his deafness, he couldn't talk. And so Pastor Mark goes behind him and he says, say, God loves me. And, and he gave us the best rendition of God loves me. And I'm telling you right now. I'm broke right there. And I just start weeping because I'm like, wow, to God be the glory. God, you did show up and you did show off your glory and you did put your love on display. And this boy who was deaf can now hear. And so I, I and multiple people almost did what the Pharisees did, but not in a religious way, just because we wanted to see it again. So I walked up behind Nestor later on that day and I walked up behind him and I was, I was like, hey, say Jesus. And he goes, Jesus. And I was like... I was, I was I was out of my mind. And so I remember when all of a sudden we finally, you know, found out again. I'm walking over and I'm crying and tears are just flying off my face there in the parking 35th and Burnham. And I walk over and Jessica's like, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I'm like, y you know, you know, the, the three boys and the two of them are deaf. And she was like, yeah. And I said, Nestor can hear. And she said, no. I said, yes, come. And so again, me to Andres, uh, Nestor's over there playing basketball in our portable hoop. And he's shooting the ball. And from a distance, I'm like, Nestor. And he goes, and she said, Shane. <laughs> and I said, watch this. And so then I said the, the St. Jesus thing. He said, St. Jesus. And he was like, Jesus. And she was like, oh my gosh. And so I'm telling everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's not because we did anything. It's because we just allowed ourselves right. to be obedient to what he wanted to do. Okay. And he wanted to do some miraculous things. And one of those miraculous things was, is this boy who was deaf can now hear. Amen. And in this story, we see this miraculous thing that Jesus takes this man who was blind since birth, and all of a sudden he does a lot. I hope he didn't, I hope it was just spit, not more. But um, yeah, and so anyways, he, he makes some mud and he puts it on. He says, now go to the pool and go wash. And all of a sudden he can see, and I can't imagine, like I see those Facebook videos mm -hmm. of the people who put those glasses on and they, they see light, like color for the first time. Right. And like, I've seen so many of it, and my heart just breaks because I'm soft. Since I said yes to Jesus, <laughs> he destroyed my heart and heart. Amen. And I cry about everything all the time. Amen. And I, I, I see this and I just start to break. I'm like, wow, like, look at that. Like God used people to create something of all the things that he's created to help people who can't see color, see color. And so here, you know, through this whole story, the, the haters are saying all these things and, and the doubters are saying these things. And, and, and they, they, the Pharisees even call, you know, the man over twice because they're, they're saying he's a liar. And, and the point is, is that it's important as Christians that we understand that the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And so often we allow the distractions of this world, the doubts of this world, the haters in this world, the hate in this world 
okay? And, and the, the trash that the world is spewing out, we allow that to speak louder than the God of the universe who created everything. And that's just mind-blowing to me. But in the midst of this, Jesus was also demonstrating that, that even on a Sunday, even on a Sabbath, it's right and it's necessary to care for people. So, it, and, and it's not just a, sometimes a Sunday, like church is like, it's just a Sunday thing or a Wednesday thing that's a once in a while thing and when my emotions get high enough thing, but it's an everyday thing. Right. Though we are in this building having church together once a week or twice a week if you're going on Wednesdays or five days a week, we need to live it out everywhere, seven days a week. Yes. And so that, you know, just moving on. So then can you, um, in verses 30, did I give you verses 35 through 41? Or is that, okay, can you put that up there? Okay, so uh, it says, Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, pause, I just want you to know they threw him out of the synagogue. And Jesus knew. And so Jesus went on his merry way to find him. Mm -hmm. Just as that person who's lost, Jesus seeks out to find them. He seeks out here and he goes to find him. He says, do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Man, I would have dropped to my knees. Mm -hmm. Different story. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believed. And he worshiped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come to this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him say this and asked, what, are we blind too? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. And so I, I think of that verse and some of us, we're literally walking blind. Because we think we know everything. We think that we've got it all figured out. We think that we have all the answers. And some of us come to church on a Sunday. And somebody's like, how are you? And I'm like, oh, I'm blessed. Praise God. God be the glory. Blah, blah, blah. But we don't keep it a buck with people. We don't right. keep it a hundred and let them know. Hey, you know what? Like, I'll just be honest. I was really overwhelmed. And right. yesterday I had some, I went deer hunting yesterday. It was a long two days for me. Because we had, I'd teach. And then we had the friend raiser here. And then I was here till like 9.15. And then I made the three hour drive. And then I had to get some stuff for hunting for Walmart. To get up at 4.45 in the morning to go out and hunt to be out there before the light hits and and I'm, and, and I'm hunting until about 10 15 in the morning go inside and I had some overwhelming stuff happen over the course of four hours which I'll touch on in a little bit and then I go back out and hunt and so I was firing on like no sleep um, and those are the moments where you really be like I got I really I really need you but in these verses that we read here uh, we see um, that he has he has this experience but he doesn't know it's Jesus Savior of the world he just all of a sudden I can see it. and it was just some guy and I think he's a prophet but then all of a sudden Jesus reveals himself to him and he has this experience with God and I want I want to tell you and this is another thing that my, my wife's grandfather said a couple days ago um, but I'll, a matter of fact I'll pause it I'll go back to it so when we have an experience with God and this man had an experience with God there's no way that you could ever confuse that voice with any other voice there's no way that you could ever confuse um, the things that he said with what any other person can say. Um, when you hear the voice of God, you just know. Like this woman right here, God said, marry her. And I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I was going to marry that woman. And uh, that's a, we met on Christian Mingle, okay, in 2011. And that's a really long process. And I'll talk about that another time because you'll be here till three. And uh, I don't want to do that. So, um, but anyways, but God said I was going to marry her. And he told me that I was going to marry her before I ever saw her face in person and before I ever saw her on video just when we were emailing. And now you got a lot of catfishing going on and all that stuff. And if you don't know what that is, it's when people fake to be somebody uh, that they're not and they'll fake to be this person. And so they, they start exchanging all this information and sharing. And then when they go to meet that person, they don't meet that person because nobody's there. It's this fake person who's pretending to be something that they're not because they're not happy with who God called them to be. Uh, but that's a different story. Um, so anyways, but when you have an experience with God, you know, right? And so which leads me to my third point. An experience with God that does not cost something means nothing. Let me say that again. An experience with God that does not cost something means nothing. It does nothing. And so me, I, I, now I can talk about what happened yesterday. See, my faith was, 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 to, was tested. Uh, because I was being mocked by two people at our hunting camp, and these are all family and friends. And I was being mocked uh, because I was a pastor, 
um, because I was I was tinkering with my sermon. Um, and the reason I was tinkering with my sermon is because I had a sermon and everything was done on Thursday. And Thursday night when I was sitting at the table reading and praying, all of a sudden God had made it very clear. He says, that's not for Sunday. That's for Easter. Mm. Okay, so I got a, a, a log jam here for this weekend. So thanks, God. And so it's like 1230, 1245 at night and I'm sitting at the table and I, and I turn to uh, the adulterous woman. And I was like, maybe that's it. And I knock out three points. You know, not the sermon, just three points where I'm going to go with this. I'm like, all right, that's legit. And then I hear this whisper. And the whisper said, just turn a couple pages. Okay, turn a couple pages. And all of a sudden, Jesus healing this man who was born blind jumped out. And I said, and that's why you wanted me to turn. Because that wasn't for today. That was for Easter. And that wasn't for day. We'll shelf that for another day. <laughs> this was for today. And what I'm telling you is your faith is going to, you're going to get, you're going to get tested uh, by some people. You're, this man was tested by the authorities. They doubted him. They called him a liar. He was cursed and he was evicted from the synagogue. You can't come back here anymore you are not welcome and persecution is going to come when you follow jesus opposition is going to come when you follow jesus you are going to get mocked it's going to happen if it isn't happened know that when you begin to do more it's coming and when it does come you need to be prepared for it so your faith isn't just circumstantial everything is good so i'm good but everything is bad i'm gonna walk away from christ i'm gonna blame god for it Instead of running to God and clinging to God and wrestling with God and saying, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm not going to let you go until you get me through this. And so, anyways, you might even lose your life. And you saw that in the scripture. Like, Christians were martyred. And they were willing to do it. They were willing to live for Jesus. And they were willing to die for Jesus. Are you willing to not only live for Jesus, but would you be willing to die for Jesus? And like I said before, when God is pleased... It doesn't matter if the world is displeased. Because if God told you to do something, he wanted you to do it for a reason. So I went to your honey on Saturday, and I'm being mocked for about four hours. I'm like, are you guys going to stop bringing the heat? And I'm trying to turn the other cheek because I'm really good at flaming people, but I really don't want to do that. If you don't know what that means, is I'm really good at making fun of people back. Um, I like to think that I'm really good at that. And, and even my students know. They'll say something. I said, do you want me to come for you right now? Because you know I'm going to roast you. And they're like, Mr. C, I'm good. I'm done. And so I, I know that I can flame both of these people severely. And they're going to get really mad if I do it. Or I can turn the other cheek and leave it alone. And so it was really hard for me, um, uh, especially with what my past looks like, to not bring the heat. And I'm talking bring the fire and just make them feel bad. But I'm like, but is that who God is really calling me to be? Is that what Jesus really wants me to be? And if, if I don't receive this mockery with grace, what kind of representation am I making for these people here? Yeah. Family or friends. And so I turned the other cheek and I'm like, okay. And so I was overwhelmed. And so I went out, when I went back out to the stand after the Badger game, go Badgers. Um, and I went back out in the stand and I'm sitting there and I just prayed. And I, and I was like, God, I thank you for that moment. Because that's just another test to be a testimony of how good you are and how we can turn the other cheek and how we can resist temptation. Um, even in our inmost being where we want to just attack back, that I can step back and be like, you know what? God, you be glorified. Because Satan wants to grab a foothold and he wants to create this barrier between you and these people and you have a choice. You can let him win or you can understand that Jesus already won. And so um, if there's no opposition in your life, and I'm, I'm going to keep it a buck. Maybe it's because you're not doing enough. Jesus. Uh, a really good friend of mine who I'm missing dearly, his name is Pastor Noah, and we youth pastored, children pastored uh, together at a different church. And we were talking, and 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 we used to chop it up. We lived together for a couple months before we both bought our houses and signed on them back to back days. Pointless information to share, but uh, <laughs> either way, I'm a details guy. My wife dry, I drives her crazy sometimes, but um, in the, in the midst of that, we would we would always have this amazing godly conversations and he said you know what it comes down to is, is if you're not getting burned it's because you ain't doing enough and so at that point i had had some people uh some friends of mine that i let live in the house and took them off the street some situations that happened i'm like hey you can live here for a while and when you're in a place where you can pay you can pay and down the road i got betrayed um and god has slowly redeemed some of those things or those relationships but when you start to make moves for the kingdom the opposition is coming when you start to tell the world what the world needs to be told, but we're not willing to tell it because it's uncomfortable for us. When you start to do those things, you can expect some resistance. Now, I don't look like it anymore, but I used to be a big, when it comes to weightlifting, 
and I've had what, four surgeries and, and got married and had kids and then reoccurring injuries where I feel like uh, I look nothing like I used to. Uh, but I know that with weightlifting, if you don't have any resistance on that bar or on that machine, you're not going to get stronger. And so what's happened is that resistance is there and that burn starts to happen, that lactic acid builds up, those muscle fibers start to break down at a microscopic level. And what happens is, is though I get sore, in the midst of that soreness, the reward is the gain. So I get bigger. My, my brothers, Timothy and Tobias, every time I see them come back from Whitewater, I'm like, holy man, are you guys lifting 24 hours a day? These boys are getting buff. <laughs> and, and, but they probably understand that if I put in this work and though it's hard, the reward comes in the game. And our reward comes in the game. And the reward is, though it may be hard to charge the gates of hell and to reach and save those people who are five feet away from falling into the abyss, though that, that may be hard, the reward is in the game. That that person has now had an encounter with Jesus Christ, God of the universe. Their life has changed. Their legacy has changed. Which means in their obedience, everybody else around them is going to have an, an encounter with Jesus. Because they were willing to be Jesus yes. with skin on. Because they understood that when I say yes to Jesus, it may cost me something. Yeah. But the reward is in the game. Hallelujah. And that's why I said before for our third point, an experience with God that doesn't cost something means nothing That's right. and so if you haven't said yes to Jesus before and, and you know that when you say yes to Jesus it's coming and if you've been walking in it and, and you haven't had that opposition yet I'm telling you right now it, it's coming but later on in John Jesus says I've overcome the world I've conquered the world what you're walking through now it, I'm not unfamiliar with it matter of fact I've experienced the worst possible thing you could experience and so I just want you to understand that the reward is in the kingdom growing not in the church growing. Because if it can be a great church, it doesn't mean it's a good church for you. That's right. And if this is about how many people fill the seats and not in on how many souls get back to Christ, then we missed it. That's right. And I'm not missing it. I don't know about you. Mm -hmm. I'm not missing it. Mm -hmm. How many lives are going to be changed and pushed away from eternal damnation because you were obedient to say yes to Christ? Knowing that it might cost you something. Knowing that it might cost you everything. But knowing that that reward is in the game. Knowing that we have to keep the main thing the main thing. Knowing those things. That's kind of important. Okay, so what's going on in your life? Where are you today? Are, are you really believing that you are a miracle from God? Are you just expecting God to show up and that's it? Or are you expecting God to show up and show off his glory like he did with the blind man? Because what he did with the blind man, he can heal our blindness too. And that's sometimes right. we're spiritually blind. That's physically right. we can see. And, and some of us might even have 20-10 vision. Yes. But spiritually we're blind because we're not walking in what God has called us to walk in. Yes. Some of us might be trying to walk in somebody else's calling. But you, it, it, you, if you want to do something, you're going to have to understand that God has called you to be a first class you. Not a second class somebody else. Yes. And so expect God to show off his glory. Not just be satisfied with him showing up and getting goosebumps. But let's walk in that. Let's show off his glory every single day that we walk out of here. Yes. Understand that when I walk out of these doors, my main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And that's telling people about Jesus by the way that I live my life. And what's going to happen is you have that St. Francis of Assisi quote that says... Preach the gospel and when necessary use words that you are a living testimony for Jesus. Yes. You're a living testimony to his grace, to his goodness, to his kindness. You're a living testimony on what a Christian ought to really look like. And when we walk this thing out, beloved, lives are going to be changed. Our world is going to change because communities were changing in the process. And so we have to walk this thing out. Expect God to show up. Keep the main thing the main thing. And understand that walking in this thing is going to cost you something. So make sure you count the cost before you raise your hand and say yes. Because though it's going to cost you anything, you're going to have rewards on this side of heaven, and you're going to have even more there. And I'm not going to sit here and count jewels and gold and all those things. But I do know one thing is that wherever God has taken me, he shared a story from it, and it's been a redemption story. God can redeem everything. Nothing is too far from God to redeem. There's no sin that can make you so far away from God that he can't reach. Like, I've got orangutan arms. Like, my arms are really long. But I know God's from heaven to earth are super long, right. but his hands are so big yet so small that he could pull Come us on. out of the pit. Yes. So where are you today? Are you trusting God in everything? Are you walking this thing out? Or maybe you're here and you're like, you know what, this is the first time I've ever heard about Jesus in this way. 
or this is the first time that I, I, I've really learned that he loves me enough to show off his glory in my life. Or maybe you're in this place and, and you're thinking about yourself and you're like, you know what, I haven't looked that highly upon myself. But God made you in his perfection. God made you as a beautiful thing and he made all of us different for a reason because he loves beautiful things. And he loves the differences in us because it's those things that make us beautiful. So whether your skin tone is lighter or darker, whether your hair is thicker or whether it's thinner, whether it's soft and, and flowy and blonde, or whether your hair is black and you can't do as much as, as the typical person can do. But God has made you that way for a reason. Yes. And what he wants you to do is embrace it and say, this is who you've made me to be. This is who you've called me to be. And I'm going to use all of this from head to toe to go out in the world and tell people about your glory, to tell people about your love, to tell people about your grace, to tell people about your forgiveness so I can see their life change the way that mine was. And I think back to who I was, and I'm so grateful that I'm not the guy I used to be, and I'm so grateful that he's and that he's made me into this. And so it's just like diamonds. There's, it was coal. It was just a lump of coal. And through tremendous pressure and heat, he makes it into a diamond. Mm. Opposition is going to create beautiful things. Resistance is going to make you into something more beautiful than you could have ever imagined. Because you serve a beautiful man named Jesus Christ who came to the earth as God in the flesh and lived a life in your place. And it wasn't about your behaviors and how you screwed up yesterday and how you sinned on the way here with road rage and flipped somebody off. It wasn't about any of those things. He said, I lived a life that you couldn't live. And I died to death that you, couldn't, that you deserve to die, and I'm giving you a gift that you don't deserve because I love you, and this is one of the many ways that I'm gonna put my love on display. That's yes. right. Can the worship team come up? So I don't know where you are today. I don't know what you're walking in. I don't know the opposition you're facing. I don't know the kind of resistance. I don't know the pressure that you're feeling, uh, but I know that pressure creates diamonds. I know that a lot of heat makes gold pure. I know that a lot of, a lot of shoving and, and flipping of a stone in the ocean makes it really smooth and has no rough edges when it makes it to the shore. I know that God does all of these things. And so maybe it's hard for you. Then let's trust God that he's going to do something immaculate out of this hardship, out of these trials. The ultimate measure of man is not where he stands in times of comfort, but it's where he stands in times of controversy and difficulty. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for today. I thank you for this wonderful place that we can call home, for this place that we can have an encounter with you. Uh, God, I hope you are glorified. God, I hope you are glorified with what we're doing here. I hope that when it's done, you're going to say, well done, my good and faithful servants. You told them everything. You didn't hold back because it was difficult. You didn't hold back because it was a tough teaching, but you told everything. I pray that that's all of our heart's prayer today, God that you would be glorified with our thoughts, with our words, with our actions, with how we develop relationships with people, with how we love people. God, we love people and we love you. And our love for you should cause us to love more people, regardless of our differences, regardless of the things that we don't have in common, regardless of the things that we're walking through, regardless of the fact that we sin different than the other person. But God, you love us the same as you love them. And you meet us right where we are. You meet us in the deep, dark places of our heart. And so, God, I thank you that you meet us right where we are. And you want everybody in this room today to know that you're calling them. You're calling them, and they are going to face some opposition. But it's worth it. The reward is in the kingdom. The reward is in souls coming to you. And maybe in this room right now, maybe you haven't given everything to Jesus Christ. So with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, if you're in this place and you're like, you know what? I've not given everything to God. I've talked about it, but I haven't meant about it. I've had my mask on for far too long, and I think it's time to take the mask off, to take the costume off. If you're in this room and you said, you know what, I actually want to make Jesus Christ my Lord and Savior for the very first time, I would just ask that with all heads bowed and all eyes closed, that you would just raise your hand. Is there anybody in this room who has never had that encounter with Jesus Christ and is saying, I want to give everything, everything to you. I'm going to open this hand, and I'm going to give what I have to you, and you're going to give to me what you need me to have. Is there anybody in this room today that wants to give their life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Or maybe you're in this room today, and you are just like, you know what, Pastor Shane, I know you've talked about the projector tripping, and, and maybe lately I've been tripping, and maybe I haven't been walking this thing out. And you're like, you know what, I'm going to get back on track with God today. I don't need to clean my life up first. I just need to give my life to him, and he'll clean everything up for me. 
makes messy things beautiful. Is there anybody in this room who says, you know what, I want to recommit my life to Jesus Christ? I see that hand. Is there anybody else? Don't quench the spirit. God is in this place. He is moving. And he doesn't just want to show up. He wants to show off. Will you let him show off his glory in your life? Will you let him today? He's God of the world. Is there anybody else in this room that once says, you know what, I want to get right with God. And it's nothing that I can do, but it's everything he can. Well, then let's pray together out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for your love and your grace. For your mercy and your forgiveness. Restore my life. Make me right with you. So I can tell everybody about who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. You are free to go. You are free to stay. Break bread, communion with people. Have conversations. Stay in worship. Soak it up. If you would like prayer, uh, I'm going to be up here. If you would like prayer, whether that's a first time thing or Every time thing, it doesn't make a difference. God hears that and he honors that. So if you would like prayer, my wife is also up here. If you don't feel comfortable talking with me, I know that she would love to pray with you and talk with you if that's a different comfort zone. So let's worship. Let's pray. You're free to go. You're free to stay in Jesus' name. Mike's off. I believe in you.
really say that honestly, you guys were amazing. Today. Thank you, brother. You guys were amazing. Yes, he was. Wasn't he? Amazing. Yeah. yeah yes, was, he was. Wasn't he? I almost didn't want to. Breathe. I was like, that was enough fill for me. Yeah. 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 Well, even have a song guy thing. Yeah, Greg, you too. <laughs> yeah, Greg. Oh yeah. Next time we do this,